Presenting Walter Houston in America for Christmas on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Good evening, this is Walter Houston. Tonight on a small island in the lonely distances of the Pacific, an island you never knew before existed and will find with difficulty on the map, a troop of soldiers handful of Navy men, a few Marines, one or two flyers, and a medical staff are celebrating Christmas. I said celebrating, but perhaps there is a better word for it. Perhaps I should have said reminiscing about their former Christmas celebrations which took place in the dim and distant past, in different settings and under different circumstances. It is with such servicemen and women as these in mind that tonight we bring you this special Christmas play. And so, with the best wishes of the season... The DuPont Company presents America for Christmas by Peter Lyon, in which I have the pleasure of appearing in the part of a master of ceremonies for an overseas USO camp show entertainment unit. And we're happy to have as our soloist an authority on American folk music, the composer of Ballad for Americans, Earl Robinson. <laughs> We are now on our small island in the Pacific. Its name will remain undisclosed for reasons of military security. But you can be sure that every inch of its ground is by now familiar to every man stationed there. By now, they've eaten their Christmas dinner and opened their Christmas packages. But there's one remaining package addressed to all the men still to be opened. A package of good cheer and glad tidings to the men in their home away from home. The group has just finished a Christmas carol, and the MC, an old vaudeville trooper, steps forward to open the show. Very good, very good. I'd like to sign you all up to join our troupe. Which one of you guys was singing tenor? Me. Well, we'll sign everybody but you. <laughs> well, what about it, fellas? Has it been a good Christmas? Why, sure. It's been okay. You don't sound very sure. Ah, oh, who are you guys kidding? Not even yourselves. Two Christmases ago, I was in Oregon standing two feet deep in snow. Look at these palm trees. Is this Christmas? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what all of us in this troop figured. Me and Marilyn here and June and the quartet there and Sandy over there with the guitar. We had a dope lot right. Right, Marilyn? Right. Right. Well, we thought everybody's been giving everybody else some Christmas presents, right? Right. All except we haven't given you any. No show tonight. That is, no regular show. And we've got a special one, right? Right. Right. We have cause to be constructed a show, something brand new, bright and different, songs and stories from our travels all over the country we love. And it's our present to you. It's the best we can do. It's all we can do. Okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. Places, everybody. The stage, that's over there. No curtain. But you can imagine it now rising. Orchestra finishing the overture. Lights dimming. Here it is. America for Christmas. <laughs> to dawn, so roll on, Columbia, roll on, roll on, on Columbia? Who's that? What are they singing about? They're singing about America, young lady, and Columbia is her symbol. She's a big country and a great country, a hot and cold country, an empty one and crowded. She's an all-over country, and whatever you want, you'll find her in America. That's why they're singing about it. They? Who are they? Why, they're the people, young lady. The people who live in America and sing songs about her and tell stories about her and lie about her and brag about her and love her. The farmers on her plains and the men who built her cities and made her strong. Roll on, Columbia. Roll on, Columbia. They're all over America right now, singing and talking and telling tall tales. If you want to meet them, 
You'll have to ho- travel the whole country, fast. Let's go. All right, and discover America all over again. Where do we start? Well, let's see. Might as well start where the pilgrim started, I guess. On the shores of New England. Old Stormy was a fine old man. Do me way, old storm along. Old Stormy was a fine old man. Way, hey, hey, Mr. Storm along. I wish I was old Stormy son. Do me way, old storm along. I'd build me a ship of a thousand ton. Way, hey, hey, Mr. Storm along. I'd fill her off with New England rum. Do me way, old storm along. And all my shellbacks, they would each have some. Way, hey, hey, Mr. Storm along. Oh, Stormy's dead. And That's New England. The song of the men who go down to the sea in ships, down to the sea from craggy inlets and deep sea ports. There's rocks all over New England. All over? All over. Even the fields and meadows of the New England farms makes it tough to make a living. There was a farmer in New England who invited his minister to pay his farm a visit. The two of them, the farmer and the minister, walked over the stony fields, the minister saying... Why was it you wanted me to come out on her farm? Reverend, I want you to pray to God with me that I'd get better crops. Hmm. What this land needs is not prayer, but fertilizer. That's New England, a rocky country. Men get to be shrewd traders in that country. They have to. What's a shrewd trader? A shrewd trader is, uh, well, do you want to watch a couple of shrewd traders in operation? A Yankee peddler with a wagon load of Yankee notions pulled up in front of a Yankee general store. The storekeeper going down into the road and asking, uh, What's the price of your razor strops? A dollar each for these strops. A dollar apiece? They'll be sold for half the money before the year's out. If one of these strops is sold for 50 cents within a year, I'll make you a present of one, mister. You will, will you? Now. Ah, uh, Ben. Oh, you, Ben? Yep. You're the witness to the contract. Yeah, I'm the witness. All right, peddler. I'll purchase a strap in those conditions. Uh, here's your dollar. Contract's a contract. I'll stick to it. Ben, I don't much like this strap now that I bought it. How much you give me for it? Hey. Well, yes, seeing it's you, I'll give you 50 cents for it. Hey, now, see here. Uh, here you are, Ben. 50 cents, it's yours. All right, all right, you win. Here's your strap for free. <laughs> Want to watch out for yourself when you're in Bethel, Mr. Peddler. <laughs> Some pretty sharp fellows around here. <laughs> Tolerable. But nothing to brag about. I made 75 cents on that deal. How's that? I got a dollar for two strops, which cost me only 12 and a half cents apiece. <laughs> I heard of the cute tricks of you Bethel fellas. I generally sell these strops for only 25 cents apiece. But gentlemen, if you want any more at 50 cents apiece, I'll be happy to supply your whole village. Yes, sir. Anything else you want to buy now? Nope. Been shaved enough by you tin peddlers. Want no more of you. It's very hard to condemn a whole class because of one or two dishonest ones. Give me a fair trial. I'm traveling all through this countryside. I can get rid of your unsaleable goods. Nope. Here, tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a fair chance. I'll sell you anything I have in my wagon at my lowest wholesale price and will take in exchange anything you please to pay me from your store at the retail price. Mm-hmm. Fair, ain't it? I'll, uh, look over your goods. Mm, got a lot of whetstones there. About how much? Wholesale price of whetstones is three dollars a dozen. I'll take, uh, twelve dozen of them. All right. That's thirty-six dollars you owe me, for which I'm to take such goods as you please at retail price. Now, uh, what are you going to pay me in? In whetstones, retail price fifty cents, you get just six dozen. There's a couple of shrewd traders. Let's move on. Let's get away from the rocky country. You think that's a bad country? Why, meet the fellow from Maryland. The dogs in Maryland are so poor that they have to lean against the fence to bark. Uh, It takes three or four pigs all at once to pull up a blade of grass. And if they want to cast a shadow, uh, it takes six pigs to do that. Should we go further west? If the country in the east is also bad... West of that country, you run into West Virginia. Now, there's some country. Hill country. 
You want to hear a West Virginian on the subject? All hills and valleys in West Virginia. Valley's real narrow. So narrow the dogs have to wag their tails up and down. Can't wag them back and forth. <laughs> Why, there's one valley in West Virginia so narrow that the moonshine has to be wheeled out on a wheelbarrow every morning and the daylight wheeled in. Well, come along, little girl. Got a lot of traveling to do. I heard that railroad whistle blow, blow, blow. Yes, I thought I heard that railroad whistle blow. I thought I heard that lonesome whistle blow, 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 and it blowed like it never blowed before. Mm -hmm. Taking this train, jump on. Where's it go? West? West, west, and it goes right by Pittsburgh. Have to look fast if you want to see it. Where? Where is it? I want to see Pittsburgh. There, there, there's a Pittsburgh fella. I've been working that Pittsburgh steel, I thought you knowed. I've been dumping that red hot slag way down the road. I've been a blasting, I've been firing, I've been pouring that red hot iron. I've been having some hard traveling load. If you want to get iron, you go in the hole. You want to get zinc, you go in the hole. You want to get lead, you go in the hole. You want to get coal, you go in the hole. You want to get oil right out of the ground. You dig a little hole about 10 miles down, and that's what you get by going in the hole. Still going west. Same road that Daniel Boone and David Crockett took. Only we can go a little faster. Riding on the Wabash Cannonball. Glides along the woodland, the lakes, and by the shore. Hear that mighty Russian engine. Hear that lonesome hobo's call. Riding through the country on the Wabash Cannonball. That's right. Just like our grandfathers did elbow room. That's what they wanted. They didn't want a neighbor any nearer than 10 miles. Besides, it's greener on the other side. The other side of what? The Mississippi River, the granddaddy of them all. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -S 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 That's right. The rivermen, the boatmen, floating down on rafts, talking easy on the night air, talking big, talking quiet, making up stories just to hear the sound of their tongues wagging. Like these two men, talking about their river, the big old Mississippi. Listen to them. Yep, this nice old muddy Mississippi River water is wholesomer to drink than the clear water of the Ohio. Let a pint of this yaller Mississippi water settle, you'll have about a half to three quarters of an inch of mud in the bottom. What you want to do is keep it stirred up. Yep, that's right. Now, there's nutrition in this good old mud. Now, you look at the graveyards, that tells the tale. Why, trees won't grow worse shucks in the Cincinnati graveyard. But now in the St. Louis graveyard, why, the trees grow up at 800 feet high. And it's all on account of the water the people drunk before they laid up. <laughs> a Cincinnati corpse don't rich in the soil any. That wasn't all they talked about either. They talked about, oh, mosquitoes, for instance. The mosquitoes in the Mississippi River Valley. I heard a man talking about those mosquitoes once. Well, sir, I'll tell you. Now, the state of Arkansas has been injured and kept back by generations of exaggerations concerning the mosquitoes there. Why, sir, these mosquitoes have been persistently represented as being formidable and lawless. But the truth is, they are feeble, insignificant in size, diffident to a fault, sensitive. Now, if you really want to hear about some formidable mosquitoes, sir... Why, then, there are the Lake Providence Colossi. Lake Providence? There are large mosquitoes there? Two of them can whip a dog. Four of them can hold a man down. I must say that that's... Why, easy. sir, this may strain your credulity, but I even seen those mosquitoes at Lake Providence trying to vote. What? Well, I have seen them canvassing around the pole. <clears throat> Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh? I overheard what you were saying about mosquitoes, and I was about to add simply that the biggest mosquitoes I've ever seen was a little further to the west, in Oklahoma. Years ago, gentlemen, I saw four mosquitoes kill a buffalo. Uh, 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 uh. Kill a buffalo, yes, sir. 
and, and pick his bones clean and leave them to bleach in the sun. <laughs> Good day, sir. Uh, what do you know? What's the matter? His, uh, his stories seem a little sizable. I can't stand a liar, sir. I just can't stand a liar. <laughs> You're listening to America for Christmas, starring Walter Houston as the master of ceremonies in a traveling USO camp shows unit on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. In our play tonight, Walter Houston portrays an old vaudevillian who is leading his USO troop through the Southwest Pacific. And on this Christmas night, they are entertaining a company of servicemen and women on a tiny Pacific island, entertaining them by giving them the best Christmas present they know. A memory of America as they remember her through our American folklore. They've covered the eastern half of the country in their special Christmas show. They're in the valley of the Mississippi right now, and I think... Yes, they're in the station, buying their tickets to the next stop. Oh, that Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. Yes, that Rock Island Line is a road to ride. And if you want to ride, you've got to ride it like you find it. Get your ticket at the station on the Rock Island Line. And so now we're across the Mississippi. This must be Arkansas. Please, Marilyn. What's the matter? The name of this state is not Arkansas, my poor benighted child. It isn't? That's what it looks like when you see it. Arkansas. No, 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 no. Now... Maybe you don't realize how strongly folks in this state feel on the subject. Years ago, there was a debate right in the state legislature when someone proposed that the state go on record to change its name from Arkansas to Arkansas. Another fellow, well, he got up and made a big speech. Mr. Speaker, you blue-bellied rascal. <laughs> I have for the last 30 minutes been trying to get your attention. And each time I've caught your eye, you have wormed, twisted... And squirmed like a dog with a flea in his hide. Gentlemen, you may tear down the honored pictures from the hall to the United States Senate. Hold down the stars and stripes. Curse the goddess of liberty. But your crime would in no wise compare in enormity with what you propose to do when you would change the name of Arkansas. Compare the lily of the valley to the gorgeous sunrise, the discordant croak of the bullfrog to the melodious tunes of a nightingale, the bray of a Mexican mule to the classic strains of Mozart. But never change the name of Arkansas! No! A thousand times no! <laughs> They didn't change the name of Arkansas, did they? No, they left it alone. And is Arkansas related to Kansas? No relation at all, little girl, not even first cousins, for they miss touching each other at their border by 40 miles. In fact, down in Arkansas, people sing a song about the people up north in Kansas. Oh, they charter back a thin in Kansas. Oh, they charter back a thin in Kansas. Oh, they charter back a thin and it rolls right down their chin. And they lap it up again in Kansas. Oh, potatoes, they grow small in Kansas. Potatoes, they grow small in Kansas. Oh, potatoes, they grow small, and they dig them in the fall, and they eat them tops and all in Kansas. Come all who want to roll. I don't think I want to stay in Kansas, if that's what it's oh, like. Well, it's not exactly like that, but the potatoes really aren't quite as big as they are in, say, uh, Idaho. They grow big potatoes in Idaho? Big potatoes in Idaho? Well, I should think pretty sizable. A couple of years ago, when they built an army camp in Idaho, one of the mess sergeants went around to see about buying some potatoes. Spoke to one of the Idaho farmers who had a little farm. Raise potatoes on your land? Mm-hmm. Will you sell me some? I need some for the army camp, other side of Lewiston. Well, how much do you want? Oh, 100 pounds. Hmm, only 100 pounds? Yeah. Nope, I wouldn't cut a spud in two for no one. <laughs> Are we out of Arkansas yet? Ah, yes. This is Texas. We'll be here quite a spot. I should think so. It's so big. And the people here, well, they, 
They think quite a bit about their climate here, too. Weather, you know, comes different pretty often. Well, seeing there's so much of Texas, I should think the weather would be all different kinds. Mm, yes, but the point is, in Texas, the weather is all kinds all at the same time. As the fellow says, nobody prophesies about Texas weather except newcomers and dumb fools. Came the time when a fresh young tenderfoot walked into a Texas saloon, walked up to the bar and ordered a drink. Men in the place, they said nothing, just watched him. You know, a young fellow finished his drink, then he hauls off and says... Well, I believe it's going to rain. My friend, did you know that there were only two kinds of people who prophesy about Texas weather? Two kinds of people who prophesy on Texas weather. Well, that's very queer. Who are they? Newcomers and dumb fools. <laughs> You say there are only two kinds of people who prophesy about Texas weather, newcomers and dumb fools. Well, you're absolutely right. For after all, those are the only two kinds of people there are in Texas. Cow country through here and to the north and to the west. Further on west, you come to the desert where it's dry. Yuma, where it's been known to get pretty warm sometimes when it's summer. And the migratory workers sing in the evening. I work in your orchard of peaches and prunes And I sleep on the ground neath the light of your moon On the edge of your city you see us now and then We come with the dust and we go with the wind California, Arizona, I may call your crops then it's up north to Oregon to gather in your hops. Dig bees from your ground, cut the grapes from your vine to get on your table your light sparkling wine. Come on, here we go again, north this time. Another train line? I'm riding on this new river train. I'm riding on this new river train. Same old train that brought me here, and it's soon gonna carry me away. That's something special for you to see up north here. What's that? Something big? Biggest thing man has ever done. Well, this world has seven wonders that the travelers always tell. Some gardens and some flowers, I guess you know them well. But now the biggest wonder in Uncle Sam's fair land. It's the King Columbia River and the Big Grand Coulee Dam. Up in the state of Washington. She winds down a granite canyon, she bends across the lee. Like a silver running stallion down her seaway to the sea. Well, she ripped our boat to splitters, but she gave us dreams to dream of the day this coolie dam would cross that wild and wasted stream. Now, as we join in battle to make all people free, that old coolie dam is fighting along with you and me. Spawned upon the Columbia River by the big Grand Coulee Dam. California. Are we going to California now? Climate, that's all there is in California. The Californian says... We got the healthiest. It's a healthy. When we started a graveyard, we had to shoot a man. Hearing which, if you raise your eyebrows in polite disbelief, the Californian says further... We don't have to prove it. We admit it. Well, that's about it. Time to be getting back home now. What? Oh, but we haven't seen nearly everything. For every part of the country, a song or a story. Not time and half an hour to do them all justice. So, boys, I guess it's the end of the show. It was enough, mister. And if you're still wondering, I'll tell you, it's been an okay Christmas. That's been the best Christmas I ever had. For the last 20 minutes, I've been standing in two feet of snow back in Oregon. Okay, and we'll have one last song. Everybody sing. For every part of the country, a song or a story. But all the parts, all the states add up to one mighty whole. One America. Roll on, Columbia. Roll on. Oh, roll.
Walter Houston and the members of tonight's Cavalcade cast, our thanks. On this Christmas night, we are thinking the same thoughts you are of men far from home in deep snow and in tropical heat fighting the battle of freedom. What is in your hearts, our hearts, and their hearts has been said powerfully and beautifully by a soldier, a G.I. Let me read it to you. At the moment, it is difficult to think of victory as meaning anything but an end of fear to loneliness and death and a chance to go back to pick up the strands of interrupted life. Henceforth, each simple pleasure, each right we always took so lightly will take on rich meaning. We know what it costs to keep them, and we know, too, that we have really earned a share in them. But victory means much more. With victory, we stand on the threshold of limitless inventions and comforts. We possess the resources to extend our horizons in every field of endeavor and every aspect of human relations. However ancient and stubborn enemies are still to be conquered. Enemies which must be overcome, not by armies, but by minds and hearts and talents set wholly free. Such enemies are poverty, insecurity, prejudice, disunity. These too shall be conquered, for we have begun to think more deeply and more dynamically. And if we can sweep aside untold obstacles, to smash the most ruthlessly efficient machines of destruction ever devised, surely we possess the vision and practical genius to organize for peace, security, and a world designed for living. Till now, many have ruled because of accident of birth and power or wealth. But throughout the world, the unfit, the weaklings, and the traitors are falling by the wayside. New leaders are rising from the people those who never sold their heritage of courage, faith, and simple human dignity. With victory, we shall have destroyed those who would have enslaved the world. Our sacrifices have been great, but we have won the opportunity to emerge from the animal kingdom and enter the kingdom of man. I look forward to living in such a world. I look forward to living in such a world. If a soldier risking his life at the front can say that, then certainly all of us can look forward. To all of you, the DuPont Company wishes a Merry Christmas. To the 34,000 DuPont men and women in the armed forces, we call Merry Christmas across the oceans. We send more than a greeting. We send our solemn pledge, we of DuPont, that we will not slow our efforts for one minute, that we will work and produce without let up until the last gun is fired and the white flag over Berlin and Tokyo at last gives us a chance to rest and say, now it's really over. That is the pledge and promise of the men and women who work for DuPont. This is Walter Houston. Good night and God bless us all. Next week, the Cavalcade of America will bring you Anne Harding in Westward the Women, the story of Abigail Scott Dunaway. Abigail Dunaway, a farmer's wife, lived in the Oregon Territory in 1850. She managed a household. She raised four children. She was an average woman of that place and time with one difference, and this difference was an idea, an idea born in Mrs. Dunaway's kitchen, an idea which today affects the life of every American woman who fought for it. Listen next week to Westward the Women, starring Anne Harding on The Cavalcade of America. Tonight's Cavalcade play was based on A.L. Botkin's book, A Treasury of American Folklore, published by Crown Publishers. For use of special songs, Cavalcade is indebted to Woody Guthrie, and for their arrangement and direction to Earl Robinson. Heard in the program was the Sportsman's Quartet. The orchestra was conducted by Robert Ombrister. This is Gain Whitman sending you season's greetings on behalf of Cavalcade sponsor, E.I. DuPont de Nemours Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is the National Broadcasting Company.